Okay, so welcome to Beauty of Colors podcast, Daryl. It's great to have you on the show. It's an absolute pleasure to be here, Cleon. You're very welcome. So tell the listeners about you and why are you so passionate about trust? So I was uh, I was born and raised in a small town in northern British Columbia and fairly isolated. And there was this sense of community, this feeling that if you could help people, you should. And uh, growing up there, I I developed a sense of empathy for others. And, and I had a series of misadventures through my life that that uh, put me in positions where I was you know, struggling, uh, facing pretty extreme challenges. And I just developed a, an empathy for folks. And I found, you know, when I moved to Victoria to go to school, I found that people would just start telling me the struggles they were having. You know, I'd be riding on the bus and some stranger would sit down next to me and say, I'm really having a hard time. And I wanted to understand what it was that made people comfortable uh, being open with me. And I started to observe that my experience of the world and my experience with other people was different than most around me. Um, you know, for some reason, people seem to be, not everyone, but but people seem to be friendlier and more open. And uh, and we were able to develop these positive relationships. And I thought, wouldn't it be nice if, if more people could experience that? And so I uh, did an undergraduate degree in psychology, did a master's degree in public administration, and then went and wrote my doctoral thesis on building trust in hostile environments at Duke in the business school there. And then I went to work for a, a management consulting firm, uh, McKinsey and Company, big strategy firm. And, and they they discovered that I had really good client hands. And so they started sending me to the worst places possible. Um, and so I, I started to be able to apply some of the theoretical work that I developed uh, and then I was involved in an automotive accident in 2001, ended up with something called post-concussion syndrome, which meant that I was just really fatigued and uh, struggled. And so I couldn't work at McKinsey anymore. And I, I started my own little company called Trust Unlimited. And I've spent the last 20 years helping people better understand what trust is and how it works and how to build it. And I got to say that when I look at the world and I see some of the problems that we've created... Um, you know, I think of them as big, hairy problems, things like climate change and political uh, divides and race relations and, and the ability of the police to, to get along with the communities they serve. And all of these things, I think, require some level of collective collaborative action for us to solve them. And trust levels are some of the lowest we've ever seen. And so I'd like to help try to fix that. Okay. So let's talk about trust. What is trust? Good question. Um, part of the challenge we face is that everyone sort of feels like they know what it is, but we don't often share a definition. So we're we're not sure we're talking about the same thing. So trust is the willingness to be vulnerable when you can't completely predict how someone else is going to behave. Well said, John Barrel. Okay. <laughs> so how can the world come together and trust each other? When everybody wants to do their own thing to advance themselves or the country? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, most of the time, you know, research on trust shows us that organizations are more effective when trust levels are higher, that that people are happier, they're more engaged, they're more connected. Life is easier when we're able to build stronger relationships. And so there is an element of um, self-involvement to getting better at building trust because it it leads us to being more successful in the world and it allows us to navigate the world more efficiently and effectively. Um, okay. So you're saying that a good relationship, if someone has a good relationship, that's kind of like the first step in the trust building process. I find, you know, when we talk about sales or we talk about uh, leadership or we talk about healthcare, there's there's an underlying element of trust that exists whenever we engage with other people in the outside world. And I think we're more likely to reach our goals and objectives if we're able to build collaborative relationships along the way. Um, I know I've got two sons, Thomas and Alexander, and they are the center of my universe. Um, Thomas has, has just gone over the last couple of years, he's been in university in Missouri. And you know, you're a transplant from Canada to the U.S. Canada's a little different uh, culturally than the U.S. is in terms of how we think about the world. And Missouri is a little more conservative than than the outside edges of the U.S. So 
he moved to this place where there were all kinds of opportunities for him to run into trouble and to to feel disconnected. And he went to a Baptist university and we're not Baptist. And, and so there was all these reasons for him to potentially struggle or fail. And he has thrived. And a big part of that is his ability to build relationships, his understanding of how to connect with the world and how to engage. And so, you know, he is, he is thriving in an environment that could have been difficult for him. And my younger son, Alexander, experienced some struggles with anxiety and uh, social anxiety and those kinds of things, things that have been really more prevalent with the onset of the, of COVID and, and those kinds of things. And so for him as well, he's really thriving. And, and part of it is his ability to connect with people, his ability to, to engage the world in a way that is less anxious, less fearful. And he's had some success with that. And so our ability to connect with other people, I think, is a real precursor for us being successful as individuals, but also for our organizations to be successful more, more wholly. Yeah, a big part of it is, is developing that sense of empathy for someone else. Um, you know, I think that trust is a combination of uncertainty and vulnerability. You know, that's part of the definition. Mm -hmm. and, and when we meet people early on, we tend to have fairly high uncertainty about them. And... And that means, you know, for me, it's it's these two bar graphs. Uncertainty times vulnerability gives us a level of perceived risk. And we each have a threshold of risk that we're comfortable with. And so if uncertainty is high, that means that vulnerability has got to be low for us to still trust that person. And as that relationship gets deeper, the uncertainty starts to compress and the range of vulnerability we're willing to tolerate or comfortable with starts to expand. And so... To the extent that we're able to build trust with others, we start to make them more comfortable. We start to make them less uncertain about us. Um, so there, it's easier to predict how we're going to behave. We're able to be a little more vulnerable uh, to the other person, engage, ask for help, offer help. You know, I find it very rewarding when I'm able to help other people. Um, and, and a lot of us as human beings do. But we often struggle to allow others to help us. And as someone, you know, I'm legally blind. I, I've got a, a seeing eye dog named Drake uh, who wanders the world with me. And Drake and I have this amazing experience in the world where, where people want to engage with us. And if we're struggling with something, people come forward to help. And they, they are happy to do so. They feel good about it. We feel good about it. Um, there's lots of positive there. And so... You know, sometimes it's it's that willingness to be vulnerable, that willingness to take that first step that allows someone else to feel like, hey, maybe there's a connection here. Maybe we're two human beings who can reach a better place together than we did separately and just feel good about that. Well, so, well, well said, Daryl. Um, what is the first step in the world coming together to build trust, especially with the circumstances like um, the pandemic, climate change, race relations, and political um, divides. Right. So if people will ask me, why are trust levels so low now? You know, they're, they're lower than they've ever been. And part of it is we're still every bit as vulnerable as we used to be, but uncertainty has gone up so much. And a big part of that, you know, during the pandemic, people got very upset about vaccines and about mask mandates and about all these different things. And it's because the rules were changing. And so as the rules start to change, we feel more uncertain. And we've got these technological advances. We've got, you know, values and norms that are shifting quicker than they have before. And for some, that's fantastic. And for others, it feels uncomfortable. And, and so we have these varying responses to those changes as well, right? So some people are welcoming and some people are angry and frustrated and and so we don't, we both don't know what the new rules are yet. And we also don't know how other people are going to respond to them or what we can and can't say without, without triggering somebody. And so a big part of this is the real spike in uncertainty that we've experienced for all of us. And we're seeing this now with younger people coming out of the pandemic, struggling with mental health crises and those kinds of things. It's a new set of rules again, as, as the world evolves and changes. And so a big part of this is having a shared vocabulary. Um, you know, I, I wrote a book called Building Trust, Exceptional Leadership in an Uncertain World. 
because I realized that, you know, I was having these really powerful experiences where I was profoundly impacting people's lives, but I was dropping a small grain of sand in the ocean. I was creating these little tiny ripples. And what I needed was to, was to scale that, to, to have people come alongside me and pick up great big rocks and drop them in the water and create a huge ripple so that we could start to make changes. And that's part of the challenge. And, and what you're helping me with right now, Cleanne, is a lot of people are talking about trust, but they're not talking about what to do about it or how to build it. And I, that's what I've done for the last 20 years is help people systematically understand, here's what trust is. Here are the 10 levers that you can pull. Here are ways to pull them. And here's how to get better at building stronger relationships with other people. Sounds good. Um, so Daryl, what would you say that the trust that people had like in the 70s and the 80s, would you say it's a different trust than what the generation generation Z is experienced? Would you say the person trust the person who was born in, in the 70s or the 80s and somebody who's born in 2000 would the trust system be different for for those two individuals yeah and that's a great question like it's clear that you're a professional um you ask such good questions um so the structures are the same in turn like trust works the same way but the rules have changed the context has changed dramatically. So for people in the 70s and 80s, there was a community that they were embedded in and people knew who each other were. And if you were a jerk, then people knew you were a jerk and everyone kind of treated you like you were a jerk. Um, whereas now with the advent of social media, our relationships tend to be a mile wide and an inch deep. And if someone goes away, there's you know 100 people to replace them. And you know, we become aware that some people are jerks, but it, it's often much too late. Um, it's after they've, you know, spoiled dozens of other people or had a, a, a profoundly negative impact in the world. Um, so it, it is different and it's moving more fluidly and we need to be more intentional than we've ever been. You know, people who, so, so a lot of times when I talk to leaders, I'll say the things you did 10 years ago are no longer going to be sufficient to build trust with the people you lead because the uncertainty that is outside your control has escalated by so much. And, and so we need to be more intentional about the conversations that we have. And a lot of times there's a discomfort, you know, just even using the word trust saying, Oh, you don't trust me. It creates a social stigma. But a lot of times when I work with organizations, we'll, we'll talk about creating a shared vocabulary where we talk about uncertainty. And we talk about vulnerability and what those things are. And it doesn't feel as personal. It feels like there's something we can actually do about it. There's something tangible there that we can we can influence. So, yeah, it's, it's much harder now for folks who have grown up um, more recently than it was in the past. It was so much easier in the past because we were all sort of more narrowly constrained. Okay. So how can we rebuild that trust for generation z well part of it is being more more transparent and more more intentional so for me there are there are levers that we can pull to build trust with others you know when it comes to uncertainty there are four levers that we can pull to reduce people's uncertainty three of them are are related to me as an individual and then the fourth one is the context so to the extent that i'm able to explain my context and the things that matter to me you get a better sense of who I am and how to predict how I'm going to behave. And then for those individual elements, there's there's three levers we can pull, which are benevolence, integrity, and ability. Benevolence is the belief you've got my best interest at heart. And integrity is, do you actually follow through on your promises? And do your actions line up with the values that you express? And then the last one, ability, is do I have the competence to do what I say I'm going to do? And for each of these, you know, we all have the ability to build trust. Some are just better than others. And so for those who aren't very good, they have a lever that they pull. You know, it's usually the ability lever. I have these kinds of credentials, this much experience, this kind of background. Those who are better at building trust have multiple levers that they pull. Those who are really good have multiple levers and they know when to pull which one. And one of the challenges we face is just, you know, a lack of awareness around who we trust and how much we trust them, who trusts us. Um, and... 
you know, I'll say to people, you know, here's the four levers that we can pull and they'll go, oh, I do that already. Well, Cleanne, it doesn't matter if I think I'm benevolent. You have to believe that I'm benevolent for it to actually land. And this is one of the challenges we face is stepping outside ourselves and thinking about somebody else's perspective and saying, what do I need to do to convince Cleanne that I'm trustworthy? You know, and and part of that is understanding what are the things that matter to you? What does success look like for you? How do I include you in a conversation that allows me to show that I have your best interest at heart? And for the integrity lever, do we have a shared understanding of what commitment I make or what promises I'm making? And so do I actually become transparent and say, do you remember when I promised I was going to be on time for our podcast today? Well, this was me. I showed up five minutes early and you and I got to chat for a little bit. That was me following through on my commitment. And so now we have a shared understanding of, okay, so that was the commitment that we made and Daryl followed through on it. And <clears throat> my values are that I, I really want to share this broadly with the world. And I, I'd love it if people bought the book and, and read it and applied it. But there's also content on my website uh, at Trust Unlimited that's free that people can go and read. Uh, in the blog section, there are articles that I've written. There's other podcasts I've done. You know, So that, to me, shows an alignment between the values that I have of sharing this information and helping the world solve some of these problems and the actions that I've taken, right? So speaking on podcasts like yours, trying to spread the word about ways that we can build trust with others. Um, I, I'm not trying to hold anything back or keep things back where, you know, just send me $200 and 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 I'll actually tell you the secrets. No, I, I've put them in the book and I've put them in my articles and I try to share them as 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 broadly as I can so that people have a chance to apply them. So what would the readers expect from your book to help build trust and transform their lives? So the book starts with an explanation of, of why I'm somebody who has a different perspective on trust than most. Um, and then it talks about the value that trust has and, and how it plays out in, in terms of them as a leader or them as a, a partner or, or parent. Um, and then it lays out the entire model for how trust works. Um, and then chapter six is here's how to apply that model. You know, here are ways to pull those different levers. And then chapters seven, eight, and nine are all case studies where I show here's where I actually applied this so that people get a better sense. Cause I'm trying to hit it from multiple modalities and, and the feedback I've gotten on the book so far is that it's a, it's an easy read. Um, I tell a lot of stories and I tried to make it accessible for everyone. So it's not written from an academic perspective. It's written from a, a person perspective. And uh, so there, there are things that people can try in the book, things that they can practice uh, and hopefully they do. Okay. So what set what sets you apart, Daryl, from other people talking about trust? There's a few things. Um, so when I wrote my thesis, I became aware that most of the literature on trust was really focused on uncertainty. Um, and it was actually really focused on uncertainty from an individual perspective. So that benevolence, integrity, ability piece was the primary stuff that most people were talking about. Um, and they were, they were talking about how important it was, but not how to apply it. Uh, and so... One of the things that really differentiates me is, is that I try to be very applied when I talk about these concepts about how do I go about pulling the benevolence lever, right? How do I show someone that I have their best interest at heart and that I'm thinking about? Um, you know, so in the book, I'll give the example of, of different cases where I've done it, situations where I've done it, but I also give people a template for a, a conversation, you know? And so imagine you're talking to someone you're trying to build a stronger relationship with, and this is what I get all my students to do when they go through my classes and go through the master class. Um, is you pick someone and you're going to have a conversation with them. You're going to say, so this guy, Daryl, was talking about trust. And he said, benevolence really matters. And I started thinking, you know, benevolence is the belief that you've got my best interest at heart. But I think I do that, but it doesn't always land that way. Have you ever experienced that? And the other person, for, for the most part, will say, yeah. You know, I, I remember when I tried to do something nice for somebody and it backfired or or they got really upset or... Um, and then the next stage of the conversation is, well, have you ever had somebody really look out for you? Like ever really felt like someone had your best interest? 
what did they do? What did that look like? How did it feel? And now we're starting to prime the pump a little bit. We're, we're having a conversation about times when you felt someone looked out for you, had your interests. It starts to give me hints about what you think benevolence looks like and ways that I may be able to act in your interests. And then we narrow the funnel a little further and we say, what would it look like if I was benevolent? What does success look like for you? How do I help you get there? What are some of the things that I could do to help you achieve the things that matter most to you? Now we're more transparent and we're able to sort of have conversations in the future where I'm able to say, remember when you told me this is something that really mattered to you? That's what I'm thinking about right now when I'm trying to do this. Because we interpret the world through stories, there's the danger that you may misinterpret my actions. And so that's the approach I take to, to trying to help people pull levers in each of these instances. The other piece was that vulnerability wasn't talked about at all by the other literature, um, which meant that trust was either present or absent. It was like a dichotomous variable, right? And and all I have to do is say, we trust some people more than others. And everyone goes, well, duh, like, how did you get a PhD for this? And and so once we start including the notion of vulnerability, we can talk about depths of relationship. And then after we make the trust decision, there's there's the perceived outcome. And you and I can have exactly the same experience, but have different perspectives on how that played out, whether it was good or bad. And, and so we can act within perceived outcome to create a shared narrative of what happened. So we've got a shared understanding and we, we try to explore each other's story. And in fact, if we do that beforehand, if I say to you, you know, if, if we'd had a chance, I would have said, Cleanne, what does a good podcast look like? What would a good outcome look like from this conversation? And so we could have developed a shared ex expectation of what good looks like. And we could have devoted our energies towards that before we reached the end. And then after our perceived outcome, it feeds back into our next engagement, our next interaction together. And the, in the middle of all this is our emotional state, whether we like or dislike somebody else or love or hate them. And almost all the trust literature treats people like they're rational actors. And I, I don't know if you've met people before, but we're not always rational, right? You know, all you have to do is date someone or have children and you realize <laughs> people can be irrational at times or siblings for that matter. So those are some of the things that set me apart from the other trust world. Okay. So where can the listeners get a copy of your book? And do you have any last words for the listeners? They can get a copy of my book anywhere that books are sold online. Uh, so Amazon or Barnes and Noble, uh, anywhere you buy your books online, you can get it as an ebook, as a hardcover book. Uh, it's available on Audible as an audio book. Um, they can reach out to me at daryl at trustunlimited.com if they want to find out more or go to my website. Um, I guess last words. Um, the aspiration is no less than creating a better place for us all. And I hope people would come alongside me on that journey and learn more about trust and the positive impact it can have on their lives, careers, relationships, everything. Okay. Sounds good, Daryl. Thank you for being in Beauty of Colors podcast. It was great to have you. So great to be here. Thank you, Cleanne. You're very welcome.